afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar of this year. Uh, my name is Ana Vallejo. I'm the Communications Manager of Myeloma Patients Europe, and I will moderate this webinar today. First of all, I would like to thank you all for attending this webinar. As you know, our main goal today is to review the most important updates on myeloma and also in EL amyloidosis presented in the American Society of Hematology Annual Congress that's well that was held uh, last month in Orlando. And for your information, this webinar will be fully recorded and will be uploaded also to the Myeloma Patients Europe uh, website, which is www.mpeurope.org and will be also available in the MP YouTube channel in case you would like to share it with someone or to watch it again. Before we start, I would like to make a small summary of the webinar agenda. As you know, the webinar is scheduled from 6 to 7, so the presentation will last about 40, 45 minutes, and then I will open the session for questions. Um, basically, there are two ways to ask questions to the doctor. One of them is using the microphone in your computer, so just press the right hand button that you can see in your screen, and then I will unmute you so you can ask the question directly to the doctor. And the other possibility is to do that in writing in the question and answer window that you will see also in your screen. I will receive all the questions and I will read them so the doctor can, can answer them. Uh, the talk today will be given by Dr. Moshe Gat, Hadassi University Medical Center in Israel. And on behalf of Myeloma Patient Europe, Dr. Gat, I would like to thank you for your collaboration and for your time to prepare and to give this webinar today. And I would la like also to take advantage of this webinar to thank you also for the two educational clips that we filmed um, uh, in us with you uh, that are also available in our YouTube channel. So thank you again, and the floor is yours. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. I'm happy and thank you, MP, for uh, selecting me to, to give you this webinar about the ASH 2019 updates. Uh, there are many updates, of course, I couldn't cover all of them, but I'll be happy to share with you, I think, the most important ones um, that I see. Uh, I will start in, in general by, um, let me see that it's working, yeah, okay. So before I start the webinar, because I'll be talking about a lot about minimal residual disease, I'd like to explain in two words what is minimal residual disease and its um, significance, because this is very important. In a way, because myeloma has become a chronic disease, we know that patients will be without any evidence of disease for a very prolonged time. So if you give a new treatment and you want to prove that it's better than another treatment, it will be very problematic to wait now for four, five, six years in order to show the superiority of the treatment. And therefore, we are looking for other biomarkers that will tell us that these treatments are truly better than others and, and they're worthwhile pursuing and even authorizing these treatments to patients even before we see long-term results. So the most advanced of these biomarkers would be the minimal residual disease. And this means that the deeper the response is, then the better it correlates with uh, progression-free survival and overall survival of the patient. So we do know that most patients will eventually, even if they're in complete remission, as we can see here, even if they go as deep as complete remission, a long time at a certain point, most of them will relapse. And therefore, um, uh, we need something to show us that maybe even patients in complete remission are different from one another. And this is what we mean when we talk about MRD. We say that when the patient has diagnosis, he has a lot of myeloma, but even when he's in complete remission and above the surface, we cannot see any of the uh, monoclonal protein, whether it is by uh, IgG or, or free light chain or whatever, um, when we measure it with very sophisticated methods, we can see even very low amount of disease. And maybe these patients who have this low amount of disease are either cured or have a very prolonged progression-free and overall survival. So this is the basis of minimal residual disease. And we have two ways of checking it. One is by a method called flow cytometry, where, where we can see and distinguish the myeloma plasma cells from the normal plasma cells by surface markers. And we can actually, by this method, see one cell in a million, one cell in 10 million. And this gives us um, a very good way to distinguish the normal cells from the sick cells. And 
Another way is by what's called next generation sequencing. This is done by uh, uh, a method that sees only the specific um, genetic changes within the cells. And we can see again, one cell in a million. And therefore, if we don't see the one cell in a million, we know we say that the patient is MRD negative. And this means that a long time, he will remain without disease, maybe for years, and some of them, of these patients, will, uh, after a lot of years, may relapse or not relapse at all. So this is an important marker that we use now in clinical trials to assess the the way the drugs uh, work and how deep is the response. So we'll talk today um, about updates that I think are new and will influence treatment in the next year or the next two years, actually. And we'll talk about induction therapy for both transplant eligible and ineligible patients. We'll talk about relapse disease, new options for relapse disease, and even for advanced relapses, new and promising options. So I'll start with induction therapy. When we talk about induction therapy, um, uh, there are two very promising agents which have already proven themselves in second line and third line uh, uh, patients, but now are becoming more and more uh, popular to use in first line. And the first of them is Dartumumab, which is a monoclonal antibody. And I'll talk about four trials where it's been shown to be very effective in the first line. The Dartumumab, is a, as most of you will know, is a monoclonal antibody that is working either through the immune system or by itself. It has a tumor, anti-tumor effect by binding to the CD38 moiety on the uh, myeloma cells and cause their death. It also modulates the immune system, but in any way, uh, most of its uh, effects are as a single agent and when combined with other agents. And the um, most uh, advanced, I would say, way of using it would be when it's combined with the um, most effective first-time therapy that is now given in many countries over the world, which is the combination of VRD, lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone. So this is a study called Griffin study, and this is a long-term or 22 months follow-up after the patients. And the study shows two kinds of patients. They, they was randomizing them, newly diagnosed patients, which were mostly transplant eligible patients, randomizing them to get daratumumab with VRD as the standard of care, or just VRD without the daratumumab, all patients or most of patients will proceed to stem cell transplantation and will continue with this regimen and thereafter with maintenance therapy with daratumumab and revlimid or just revlimid alone. And the results are, as expected, the daratumumab will give a very deep response. So most patients at the end of consolidation and after that, during the maintenance phase, say, 80% of the patients will be in complete remission, which is not, uh, uh, which is far higher than um, the VRD alone, which gives very nice responses. As, and this is the reason that VRD is used as first line treatment in many patients nowadays. Um, but moreover, you can see here that when we check the MRD negativity, we get about 50% of patients as compared with 20% of patients uh, will remain um, with uh, uh, minimal residual disease. And this mostly means that if we now follow this trial for a very long time, meaning for five, six years, we will probably also see advantages in both progression-free survival of the patients and overall survival, even though these patients got an excellent treatment. So this is kind of a very good treatment even to date without the daratumumab, but see that we can make it better with the daratumumab. Same goes with patients who are um, um, transplant ineligible. And this is a trial that was published about a year ago called the Alcyon trial. And it was, again, randomized the patients to get daratumumab with, venet with um, uh, Velcade, Melphalan, and Prednisone. These are elderly patients or patients who are too frail to go uh, for autologous transplantation. And this was compared with um, the Velcade Melphalan prednisone only. Um, and now we get a kind of a more advanced results after immediate follow-up now of 40 months. 
So after 40 months, we can see that even though most patients responded at the first analysis, at the second analysis, we still have most patients uh, responding for a long time and much better than with Velcade-based therapy alone. And again, we can see, even though it's not as uh, good as it was with the Griffin trial, but still for uh, many patients, they become MRD negative, even though um, um, they were treated with um, um, less intensive therapy. And this MRD negativity is by far more than was achieved with the Velcade-based therapy, and it's also sustained a long time. And this means, again, that these patients may, re may remain in remission for a very prolonged time. Another trial that is showing very promising results, and this is a, a, a more prolonged follow-up period, is the Maya trial. Again, there are two MAB added to Revlimid and dexamethasone as compared with Revlimid and dexamethasone alone in transplant ineligible patients. And so we can see once again that the overall response rate are higher and the MRD negativity is far higher than the one achieved with Revlimid and dexamethasone alone. And this has also translated to uh, a progression-free survival because we have now a median follow-up of 28 months, uh, a far better progression-free survival. And what's interesting is also to note the fact that we get kind of a plateau here. And this plateau is very promising because although we always say that do not look at these uh, uh, drawings, do not look at the end of the drawing, but look somewhere in the middle, but this middle shows that many patients will probably remain um, without progression for a very long time. And hopefully this plateau will continue to be along the next few years. And these patients have benefited a lot from the combination therapy. So in many countries, I suppose that during the year of um, um, 2020 and probably 2021, the combination of daratumumab with Revlimid or Velcade-based therapy will become the standard of care if possible um, in most countries, at least for transplant ineligible patients, and probably a long time also to transplant eligible patients. Now, this is a trial which was done in Europe, and it's an interesting trial because it was done for patients, not only they are transplant ineligible, but these are also frail patients um, with uh, either they're unfit or very frail, meaning that their performance status is low. And it was combining, again, there are two with ixazomib, which is an oral proteasome inhibitor. So it's a very convenient uh, method to give patients, even with their, when they're at home, at the beginning is more intensive, but afterwards, a long time, when you give the daratumumab are once a month, it's very convenient and you can give the uh, most of the treatment at home and the patients do not need to get into the hospital. And this is um, a very early report because it's only in 10, 23 patients were frail and 23 patients were unfit. And you can see here from the patient population that the patients in terms of myeloma were kind of the same myeloma patients, but very elderly. The frail patients are even 80 years old. And, and you can see that when we talk about the ability to do things, this is the performance status. Uh, most patients will be in an advanced, uh, not so good performance status. And nevertheless, the toxicity was low and the response rate are really excellent for a very low intensity uh, uh, regimen, uh, which is combining just two or two and a half medications with the dexamethasone low dose. So this is very promising in terms also of the frail patients. Going over um, to another intriguing way of seeing things, this is a negative trial. It's called the GEM Claridex, but because it's a negative trial, it's important to understand the limitation of what we believe and how important trials are to be done. This is a, a, a trial which was comparing patients who are getting Revlimid dexamethasone as an uh, induction therapy, uh, patients who are transplant ineligible, to uh, Revlimid and dexamethasone combined with clarithromycin. Clarithromycin is an antibiotic. It, by itself, it has no effect whatsoever on myeloma, and this has been proven in many trials in the 1990s. But when it's combined to IMID, it has been by retrospective reports mostly, or even small prospective report, reports, 
it is shown to so to show very nice and deep responses uh, uh, added to revlimid and dexamethasone so this trial is was extremely important because it's a randomized it's open label but it's randomized trial so half of the patient got the clarithromycin with the revlimid dexamethasone and half got just revlimid and dexamethasone so you can see here that unfortunately the progression free survival was not different between the two arms although the responses were much better with the addition of uh, declarithromycin and deep responses of very good partial remission and complete remission were far, far higher than the ones achieved with revlimid and dexamethasone but this did not translate to better progression free survival or better overall survival which stayed the same with both medication and the reason was actually because of excess toxicity of this antibiotic. Most toxicities was due to infections. So patients who got the clarithromycin, even though it's antibiotic, actually suffered of more infections. And therefore the, the results, the, the bottom line results are that this addition of clarithromycin to revlimid and dexamethasone did not make anything superior in the treatment of the patients. And what the investigator concluded is that this phase three trials has shown no significant improvement and actually even though the clarithromycin significantly increased response rate the this addition did not uh, um, uh, translate into better su survival rates and actually in patients who were old and frail it was even detrimental and they suffered of severe infections which prevented them to, from getting treatment and even prevented them from benefiting from these better responses and possibly one reason would be that clarithromycin elevates steroid levels and so in the future if you want to deepen a patient's response you may want to add clarithromycin but do delete the dexamethasone which causes a lot of infections other severe problems a very promising drug which we know uh, for a long time is the carfilzomib kiprolis which has been shown now in the two trials to be very beneficial to patients the first trial is a forte trial it's kind of like the griffin trial in a way that these patients are transplant eligible patients a large trial which was done in italy and in europe um, was uh, randomizing patients to get carfilzomib with revlimid and dexamethasone and compare it mostly either to short-term car carfilzomib, revlimid, and dexamethasone, or to um, carfilzomib cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone, kind of like the Velcade cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone, VCD, cyborg D uh, regimen, and to see which regimen is better in a long time with maintenance. And we get early results from this trial, um, and this a, a trial has been showing to be the fourth trial very efficacious so you can see that most patients will respond these results are better than with the cyclophosphamide when you combine the carfilzomib with the revlimid and not with cyclophosphamide and as you can see here the mrd negativity rates are very close to those seen with even the daratuma based therapy um, with the revlimid and dexamethasone or with the velcade and dexamethasone and or prednisone sorry so Carfilzomib seems to be a very efficacious and very good medication to be used in the upfront setting as well. And here's a small uh, report, but it's important to um, very high risk patients. And we're talking here about primary plasma cell leukemia, which we know is a very detrimental disease. And um, these rare patients with myeloma who have plasma cells in their blood uh, will have a very poor prognosis. So this is an first large trial prospective trial again done in europe and this is a report of the first 15 patients in the trial were treated again with carfilzomib revlimid and dexamethasone with tandem autologous transplantation and thereafter consolidation and maintenance treatment and in a way uh, this treatment was very well um, um, uh, balanced in the patients and the patients endured it very well and it had stellar results, meaning that patients with plasma cell leukemia, which is a very difficult disease to treat, and in the past we used to treat it with mostly with high dose chemotherapy and a lot of chemotherapy here with little amount of induction chemotherapy, the KRD regimen, we still get very high responses and some very deep 
complete remission and very good partial remission responses. So this is very encouraging for these very difficult patients. What about relapsed myeloma therapy? So there are old and there are new players on the block, and I would like to talk about two uh, main trials. One is the combinate the candor trial, which combined the ratumumab with carfilzomib, both medications which we talked about uh, a few minutes ago. And here in the second line, the combination of both is showing very promising results. And also I'll talk about a little bit about venetoclax. So the CANDOR trial was a study design where the patients got carfilzomib, dexamethasone, and daratumumab as compared with carfilzomib and dexamethasone alone, which is the standard of care treatment for relapsing patients nowadays. And the combination, the idea is that the daratumumab will probably was thought to enhance the progression-free survival and in the future, the overall survival of the patients. And indeed, this has been a late-breaking abstract and very impressive results where we have higher response rate, even for relapsing patients, 84% of overall response rate is really good and very good partial remission, which is stellar for relapsing patients. And also quite a lot of patients getting MRD negativity, even in the second, third, fourth line setting for some of the patients as compared with carfilzomib and uh, dexamethasone alone. Talking about venetoclax, this is um, a new medication which was put on hold for the last year and the reason is is because of its toxicity. It's been used in CLL and nowadays in acute myeloid leukemia quite a lot with very good results and it's been tried in myeloma. The idea of the medication is that it blocks a protein called BCL2 and BCL2 is a protein which is important for cell survival. When it's high, it prevents the, the cell from dying. It's called apoptosis, the dying of the cell, and BCL2 prevents this dying. And when you add venetoclax and you inhibit this BCL2, the organelles in the cell cause it to undergo apoptosis and to die. So it's been thought that it will be efficacious because it's very efficacious in many diseases, in myeloma as well. And now it was combined with venetoclax, the venetoclax was combined with carfilzomib, as we've spoken before, in this very early phase trial, 42 patients, uh, advanced disease, one to three prior therapies, and the venetoclax was checked in relatively high uh, um, um, uh, levels that was needed to, to treat the patients. Nevertheless, the results are very good. The median, in, the med in a short median follow-up, we can see that most patients actually responded very well. The overall response rate were, again, very good for relapsing patients, 80% of the patients with an overall response rate. Most of them, or almost most of them, are in complete remission, and that is even though more than half of them are refractory to previous therapy. Interestingly, venetoclax works mostly on these patients, the transplant, the, the uh, translocation, 11, 14 positive patients. These patients, you can see here that almost all patients respond and these respond, responses are very deep. So venetoclax seems like a very good medication for T1114 positive patients mostly. The interesting part was coming from a trial which was actually a negative trial and put venetoclax on hold for a long time. This trial called the Bellini trial compared venetoclax with bortezomib to bortezomib alone. And it was expected to get better results with terms of response rate and progression-free survival. So indeed, progression-free survival was much better when venetoclax would added to Velcade. But this did not translate, translate to overall survival benefit, quite similar to what happened with the gem claridex trial Although the responses were much better, uh, these responses did not translate to overall survival benefit because of infections. So it might be too toxic. And in the trial, it was mostly um, it was mostly uh, important to understand who are the patients who actually, even though the survival benefit was not evident a long time, would benefit from the venetoclax treatment. And again, we can see that these um, um, drawings show that everything left to the panel favors venetoclax and everything right to the panel favors ven uh, Velcade alone. And 
you can see here that not only the, the, the translocation, 1114 patients benefited a lot from the addition of venetoclax as expected, it's also those who had high expression level of BCL2 genes. So maybe in the future, when designing trials for venetoclax uh, treatment, it would be very important to select patients who are T1114 positive and or BCL2 gene expression high. And these patients may benefit from this treatment much more than all of the patients. So this has been shown also patients with both of them or either of them, um, showing very high response rate, very high deep response rate, and this is actually translated to better progression-free survival. So this is a very important message to a drug that was almost uh, withdrawn because of its toxicity, but seems like some patients may benefit a lot from it. So let's go over to therapies for advanced stage multiple myeloma. And here I'm going to talk mostly about uh, new agents and about anti-BCMA therapy. And we're talking about either CAR T cells, which are the highlights of the ASH, or newer antibodies. And we don't know yet which will be better because they have not been compared, and even these are very preliminary. BCMA itself is an epitope on the membrane of plasma cell, and it's very specific to plasma cell. So most cells in the body will not have BCMA, and it becomes therefore a very important target to try to find antibodies that will be able to um, uh, uh, attach to it, or to use CAR T cells to, um, to kill these myeloma cells. And when we talk about CAR T cells, just a general because, uh, talk about CAR T cells, just because it's so important and this is going to become the next generation of treatments for very advanced patients. You know that tumor cells, whatever tumor, are in, in being evading the immune system, which is trying to, to, to um, eliminate it, but the tumor cells have found many ways to, to hide from these immune system cells that in normal uh, immune system or, or in, in very small tumors are possible uh, to, to um, overcome them. But um, the tumor cells themselves, when they interact either with some of the immune system cells um, or with the T cells themselves, they become hidden from these T cells and the immune system of the body of the patients with myeloma are unable to, um, to um, put the patients into deep remissions or, or to even to, to um, eliminate most of the tumors. And so this uh, CAR T technology was designed where we take an, actually an antibody, which is against the BCMA epitope on the membrane of the plasma cells, and we attach it over the membrane to a stimulatory molecule, and this will be the membrane of the immune system T cells, which are cytotoxic to the tumor, and when the T cells will attach the tumor, they will um, eventually kill it. So this is how it's done. The antibody is inserted, it's anti-BCMA, it attaches to the BCMA, and then more T cells come there and eventually they release cytotoxic granules that will kill the plasma cells. So that's the idea of the CAR T cells, but it's a difficult procedure where you take the T cells, you isolate them, you input into them this receptor to the BCMA, you grow them, you modify them, and when they're ready, you infuse them. This takes roughly a month. So from the moment we collect them, if we may manage to collect them, and manage to grow them and manage to do everything, we give them back to the patients and it takes about a month. So it's a very prolonged uh, um, and, and uh, very vulnerable uh, um, situation where the patient is now with active disease and has to wait a month till the cells come back. And so this is a report from the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a very important journal. This is, um, uh, has been shown uh, the result of the first CAR T cell in myeloma. Before that, we have very good results in lymphoma and also in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. But now in myeloma, here in about 40 patients, where you take the patients, you take their T cells, 
you manufacture the CAR T cells, you give them in the meanwhile some sort of a bridging therapy and lymphodepleting therapy in order for these CAR T cells to expand, and you infuse them and go a long time and see what happens to the patients. And you can see here, not a lot of patients, but very nice responses. So most patients will get to complete remission, very good partial remission, and even MRD negativity, you see these asterisks in most patients. And these results, these uh, um, lines show that these patients are with ongoing results for a long time. And so the progression-free survival to those patients receiving enough CAR T cells was pretty much, it's not forever, but pretty much uh, for a long time with the median progression-free survival of 12 months, which is far better than any other medication for advanced stage patients, either patients after five, six, sometimes even more lines of therapy. And by now, we have about four or five different CAR T cells in clinical trials. And it, for myeloma itself, and maybe more are coming in the future. So <clears throat> this is a very exciting times for myeloma treatment using just immune therapy. And at this ash was reported the report, the results of two large trials, relatively large trials. One is called Legend 2, and the other is an extension trial, which is called the CARTITUDE. The Legend 2 is actually a Chinese trial. It was, um, CAR-T is very uh, explored and done in China. And again, the CAR-T was uh, uh, manufactured after collecting from the stem cells, given some kind of a conditioning regimen, and after that infused to the patients. And this is a prolonged follow-up time after these patients, because the results were already published um, uh, in 2018 ASH, but this is a long-term results. And one of the main problem with CAR-Ts is the toxicity of the treatment. And two most important toxicities are CRS, which is cytokine release syndrome. This is a severe side effect that happens from the CAR-T. It um, uh, causes kind of a cytokine storm. It means that the patient will have high fever, low blood pressure, and they can even get to severe um, uh, pulmonary congestions and, and fluid overload, and some of them are needed to be transferred to the uh, intensive care units for prolonged periods of time, and it can even kill some of the patients, unfortunately. So this is a very serious side effect that happens with CAR-T, and the other one is neurotoxicity that can range anything from being just a little bit disoriented to severe uh, depression of, of consciousness, and even loss of consciousness. But you can see here, and this is very important, that in CAR-T patients in myeloma, unlike in lymphoma, uh, these uh, side effects are not very severe. Grade one to three are not severe. Grade four and five are very severe. But most patients did not have severe side effects. Only one or two patients had severe side effects from the CAR-T. So this is very encouraging that this uh, therapy, even if it's not entering for uh, indefinite periods of time, is safer in myeloma patients than in lymphoma patients. And the long term here in 57 uh, in patients, this CAR-T showed very high. 74 uh, uh, patients are in complete remission, almost 68% of patients in MRD negativity, so these are deep remissions, and the patients who are in complete remission had a 29 months median duration of response. So this is a long time for patients who are usually something like um, third, fourth, or even more lines of treatment. So most people say, okay, that's in China. In China, they do things different. These are uh, patients who did not get daratuma. These are not these uh, patients who are very resistant. So same construct like the Legend 2 was tested um, in the United States. It's a CARTITUDE 1 study. So these are less patients, but same protocol, same uh, CAR T cells from these patients using the same contracts, but the same results. Only 29 patients, but side effects are pretty much the same. No severe side effects. Most patients had not severe side effects. And the um, results are, again, 100% overall response rate, and most of the patients in complete remission, and even most of uh, um, the patients uh, of 
has very severe or very low uh, MRD or MRD negativity. So this is very impressive and very encouraging in terms of what's going to happen in the myeloma field within the next couple of years. And the duration of response is pretty much prolonged. It's not very, it's not a long time of, of you know, just six months of follow-up, but 27 of 29 patients are in prog are progression-free uh, of their diseases. So this is very good for patients who are in general after five, six or more lines of therapy. And you can see here that during the ASH there were kind of um, a lot of talks regarding uh, CAR T cells and about ways to prolong these progression-free survival to expand periods, to expand the number of CAR T cells, very um, sophisticated methods to, to elevate their levels. And so probably within the next few years, we will have a very effective therapy. So the summary of CAR T cell therapy in multiple myeloma to date is to say, that um, we can see that most of the patients will respond to it. So far, the responses are not permanent, but they're very prolonged, much more than with any other medication. And ongoing studies are showing that there are other CAR T cells, uh, moieties that might be used, that maybe you can target dual CAR T with two types of CAR T, one against the BCMA, one against the CD19 or, or CS1, SLAMF7, there are many other uh, uh, ways to enhance this CAR T cell toxicity and, and uh, efficacy. So the future is really bright in these terms. But to patients who do not have this available, or uh, because it, probably it will also be extremely expensive, and also because it's very preliminary, there are antibodies. And I'm going to talk about one antibody that was presented in, uh, during the ASH, and it's very promising as well. Uh, maybe you've heard before about an antibody which was presented last ASH in 2018, which is called Belantamab mefadotin, or it's a GSK antibody, and it's also directed anti-BCMA, showing in the preliminary trial very nice results, about 60% overall response rate to very advanced patients um, who got, again, five, six lines of therapy. So with a median progression-free survival of, of roughly eight or nine months. So it's a very promising agent and it's already being used now in phase two and phase three trials. Uh, hopefully will be registered by the end of um, 2020 at the FDA and probably after that in Europe as well. Um, there is uh, a new technology using antibody which is called BITE, which one side binds the T cell and the other side binds the tumor cell, the myeloma cell, and engages the T cell with the uh, tumor cell just the way it was with the CAR T cells, but just without the CAR T, just with an antibody. But this is very preliminary and we still don't have results for these preliminary trials. However, during the ASH was presented a kind of a bite, it's called an engager, and it's an antibody, which one side of it by, by, binds the uh, uh, BCMA. And there's another moiety over here, which binds the CD3, which brings actually, the CD3, the T cells to the myeloma cells, and therefore allowing the cells to destroy, the, the T cells to destroy the myeloma cells. And you can see here just 30 patients, um, very advanced patients, some of them having 13 lines of prior treatments, median of five prior lines, most of them completely uh, um, uh, non-responsive to imids and proteasome inhibitors and daratumumab also, most of them got uh, anti-CD38 antibodies. So they're actually, these patients are resistant to most therapies there are, and they're high-risk patients. And these are the results, again, um, actually treatment-related side effects were not that severe. There was cytokine release syndrome, but mostly very easy cytokine release syndrome, just like we get in CAR T, low amounts of cytokine release syndrome, um, some infections, and you can see here very stellar and good results. We're talking once again about 60% uh, uh, responsiveness, and most of these responses, even though short time uh, of follow-up, are prolonged and very good. So this is another very promising target antibody which hopefully will come into clinic very soon. 
at the end of my talk, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, two more trials. Uh, one is called Ikaria using uh, a newer anti-CD38 antibodies and the other using Selinexor. Um, the anti-CD38 antibody, um, which is called Isatuximab, uh, was combined to pomalidomide for advanced stage patients as compared with pomalidomide alone, and it's already been published in the literature in The Lancet uh, uh, um, about a month ago, and showing very nice results and prolonging progression-free survival and actually even overall survival for patients when you combine this tuximab, the, the daratumab-like antibody with pomalidomide and dexamethasone, and this is a very impressive results in terms of very advanced patients. Another agent is called Selinexor, and it's actually a very interesting uh, molecule which prevents the cells from moving things from their cytosol to the nucleus, which is the brain of the cell. And when you prevent that, the cell will die. And also, some medications will remain within the nucleus and be more effective. So when you combine Selinexor to other agents like pomalidomide or Velcade or whatever, it will make them more potent. And these are the results from a big trial called the STOMP trial, combining the pomalidomide with uh, the uh, um, selenexor. And you can see here that most patients um, even got, of course, lenalidomide and bortezomib, but some of them even got pomalidomide and are refractory to pomalidomide, even though they were refractory to pomalidomide. I'll go over the adverse event in a moment. Even though they got it, uh, even though the, the they were exposed to pomalidomide and resistant, about a third of them regained their sensitivity. And those who never got pomalidomide were actually with very nice results. So it's a very promising agent. Problem with this agent is that um, um, it is uh, uh, toxic in a way that it causes mostly nausea and fatigue. So most of the patients will suffer of loss of appetite um, and will feel very weak with this medication. So we're still learning how to balance these side effects with the efficacy, which is very impressive when you compare these very advanced patients when you give it with another agent. So in summary, we talked today about new first line options, mostly with daratumumab and with, um, with uh, carfilzomib. We talked about the potential of venetoclax. We spoke about uh, Anti-BCMA therapy, CAR T cell is very, very impressive and very promising. And so are the new antibodies which are coming during the next two years. I didn't have time to mention new data on MRD and fine methods for monitoring patients. I didn't get to uh, mention transplantation feasibility in elderly patients and ixazomib for second line amyloidosis patients, melflufen, which is a new uh, um, chemotherapy like melphalan, but much more effective for advanced stage patients and much more, but time is up and I'm ready to hear your question. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope that you are coming out of this with much more optimism. Thank you very much, very much, Dr. Gat, for your wonderful presentation. Now I will open the, the floor for, for questions. Just quickly remind you that, that there are two ways to ask questions. One of them is using the microphone in your computer by clicking in the right hand bottom, and the other way is sending your questions in the Q&A window um, uh, that you will see on the screen. And obviously, I will read them to, to so the doctor can answer them. Um, I can see one of the hands uh, in the in the screen, so we will start with the, um, with that questions uh, in the microphone, which is which come from David. So I'm going to unmute you, so you can ask uh, your question. So David, not sure if you are listening. Well, it seems he's, uh, he has some some um, technical problems. So if you have problem with your microphone, maybe you can um, send me the question in writing and I will ask to the doctor. So the next question is um, regarding candor, candor trial. Um, it says, thank you for explaining the result of candor. The results were really good, but uh, what about uh, side effects? What were the main side effects for patients? Well, um... The Candor trial was um, was uh, a trial that combined, just to remind you, daratumumab and carfilzomib together for relapsing patients. And um, 
it, uh, uh, the side effects expected are both from the daratumumab and the carfilzomib. So the most uh, um, probably uh, recurring side effect would be infections. And we know that to both dexamethasone and carfilzomib and daratumumab infections are the main side effects that happens. Um, uh, and each medication has its side effects. Daratumumab is actually very easy and only first uh, uh, infusion gets uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, side effects, but after that, allergic side effects. But after that, it's very durable and 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 and, and not difficult to enter. However, um, carfilzomib has a little bit more side effects in terms of um, lowering the blood counts and also causing some chest discomfort, sometimes um, shortness of breath. Uh, but it's also not a very difficult medication uh, in the long term. So most patients will enter it uh, very well. And actually, the side effects, when you compare these to the carfilzomib and dexamethasone alone therapy, were not higher and were not, and these side effects were not higher than what was recorded with daratumumab with other agents or uh, to um, daratumumab combined um, with, uh, with Velcid and, 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 and or uh, Revlimid, or, and neither was it more side effects, severe, severe side effects, maybe a little bit more infection than with the carfilzomib alone. Thank you, doctor. Uh, the next question is, uh, CAR-T uses the existing immune system to kill the tumor's plasma cell. So when you have a low hemoglobin and low leukocytes, uh, will CAR-T be, be lesser effective, less effective? No. Um, the only problem would be with collecting CAR T cells. And we know that in order to expand them, because we need the T cells, uh, we need about at least 300 or to 500 T cells, or usually requirement of more than 1,000 lymphocytes in the peripheral blood in order to collect the CAR T cells, the, the T cells to, to make them into CARs and to expand them. So if the counts are very low, not the hemoglobin, but mostly the lymphocyte count, that might be a problem. But if they're okay, then the cells are collected and afterwards, whatever therapy and the CAR-T, we lower the, the counts, but that would be kind of like a um, small transplantation that will take two weeks and then it, everything will revive and get better again. And, and so counts are not the main caveat to, to having CAR T cell therapy. Thank you, doctor. Next question. How do you see CAR-T developing in the future? Do you think donor CAR-T will become more preferable? Okay, so donor CAR-T are very promising in a way that you do not need counts, you do not need um, the, the immune system of the patient in order to make them. And they're off the shelf because you have these donor CAR-T and all you need to do is to take them off the shelf and give them to the patients and you don't need to wait a month till they expand, if they expand and, and the disease does not progress during this month. And so it's much a better idea. Problem is that it's donor and it's uh, still very early and very difficult to know if these cells will not attack the body, if these cells will not, uh, the, the, the body of the recipient uh, by the donor cells and if it will be as efficacious as the CAR T coming from the patient himself. So this is very preliminary, but probably the future will be not only CAR T, but also other immune system cells like natural killer cells, NK cells, and other cells that might be the real future for CAR T, a, a allogeneic coming from a donor. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. Trial with, with menetoclas, carfilzomib and dexamethasone. A lot of patients discontinued the trial. What was the reason? Mostly toxicity. As we said, there are many infections um, due to the um, when patients get venetoclax, and carfilzomib might be sometimes not very easy as well to um, to um, enter. But uh, um, still, um, the results are are um, pretty much very exciting because most patients responded and had deep responses. So we still need to learn how to manage the toxicity, uh, mostly of venetoclax 
which seems to be much higher in myeloma patients than in CLL patients or even in acute myeloid leukemia patients. Um, we're learning this medication. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. The next question is about minimal residual disease. What were the, the main updates in minimal residual disease? And um, is minimal residual disease already used as a surrogate endpoint in clinical trials? Okay. The first part of the patient, the, the, of the question again? Main updates in the minimal residual disease and if minimal residual disease is used as, as a surrogate endpoint in clinical trials. I'm not sure if I understand. So the main, the, the, we do see, of course, that the, the, the earlier we use high efficacious treatments, we get better results in terms of minimal residual disease. And this has been shown by now in many trials, minimal residual disease is really and truly correlating with prolonged a uh, progression-free and overall survival. One question that is not answered or two questions that are not answered yet is one, the durability. So we take a certain point, say three months post-transplantation and we measure MRD, but does this mean that in, if we recheck it in six months, it will still be MRD negativity? This may be much more important than checking it once uh, and, and getting much better correlative results in a way. And second question is whether this is really a good biomarker or is it just a coincidence, meaning that um, the fact that we get the patient to MRD negativity, so if you're the lucky 50% that gets MRD positive, is this because we got better therapy or is this because this is the genetics of the disease which allows it to become more sensitive to the medications and MRD negative? So we don't have an answer to this yet and the biggest question would be, is it worthwhile to take patients who are MRD positive and not negative and to add more uh, uh, intensive therapy in order for them to become MRD negative, will this change anything in the long term? So we don't have an answer to this yes, yet, and this is why regulatory authorities are not yet really convinced that this is the only way to look at clinical trials, and we still use progression-free survival and overall survival both, of course, as the main endpoint of, of most trials, but it seems like this MRD negativity, I think within a year or two, will become a very important biomarker that will be used even by regulatory agencies as well. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is, uh, was there any important update regarding the amyloidosis? Is there any new treatment in this area? Okay, so um, I was quite disappointed to see that there weren't too many uh, trials reported. Uh, on AL amyloidosis, many small things. The largest trial reported was the one that I did not describe, which was actually a very big trial, and it was started eight or nine years ago. Um, and that's what makes it a bit disappointing, because back then the therapies for AL amyloidosis at second line were either melphalan or um, Revlimid, not much more than that. Pomalidomide was not authorized back then. Daratumumab for sure was not authorized back then. And so it was comparing ixazomib and dexamethasone treatment to any standard of care second line or third line treatment, which was these agents, cyclophosphamide, uh, melphalan, uh, and revlimid. And it was showing that ixazomib was actually as good as there were more deeper responses, which is, looks very good and very promising. The thing is that by the time that this trial is, is, is published, and it's very nice to know that ixazomib is, is a good medication and it's not very toxic, and we can use it in AL patients, it's worthwhile to say that nowadays a patient who will relapse after first-line treatment will probably get a daratumumab-based therapy, which has been shown to be extremely promising in both in terms of responses, and especially responses in AL amyloid patients where the um, myeloma uh, proliferative part is not very deep, so we get very deep responses with this agent, whether combined or not combined with uh, other agents like Velcade or, or Revlimid or even Pomalidomide. So um, in a way, we didn't get a lot of, of um, things about AL amyloidosis in this ASH uh, meeting. Hopefully there is an amyloid biannual meeting 
uh, in two months and we'll hear some new things in this respect. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, the next question is um, again about minimal residual disease. Will the use of minimal residual disease as a trial endpoint lead to a heavier treatment, more to reach uh, minimal residual disease? So that's the big question. There are trials being designed now to answer this question, meaning we take patients uh, who are MRD positive and randomize them to get more intensive treatment as compared to standard of care maintenance treatment and and um, see if this will change anything in the long run. We will have an answer, unfortunately, in a few years from now, when probably MRD will become the standard of care point that we will want to get to. But this is how things work. It takes a long time to get real definite answers. But it took a very long time to establish, for instance, Revlimid as a maintenance therapy because we weren't sure if it was really, really a, a benefiting the patients a long time. And now we think that it is benefiting, but there still is. We don't have an answer. For instance, if Revlimid maintenance is as good as giving Daratumumab and Revlimid maintenance or, or waiting with the maintenance therapy and giving Daratumumab and Revlimid after the first relapse, we really don't have any good answers to that. And, probably by the time we'll have answers to if we need to put the patients into MRD negativity using any aggressive treatment we have, uh, by the time we get the answers, we will probably uh, be somewhere else with all other treatments. And that's good because this means that we are going to have in the next few years a lot of newer treatments. Thank you, Doctor. We are running out now out of time, but we have um, uh, some time for the last question. And uh, is Selinexor already a standard therapy for relapsed patients? So Selinexor is authorized in the United States only right now in terms of the uh, FDA authorization as a fourth, fifth line treatment as a single agent. Um, as I said, it's not an easy agent, but it's very promising seems like when combining it with other agents, it will be very effective even in very advanced patients. So um, it remains a future to see where its place will be, in, especially in terms of these severe side effects, which are very problematic when you were in advanced patients, you like to have some sort of, um, of uh, quality of life when you get the treatment. However, um, we will learn how to use it, I guess, in the next couple of years. Right now, it's certainly not the standard of care, but it's very promising. So many patients will get it on compassionate basis in Europe and, uh, and in Israel. Um, and uh, in the United States, it's, it's obtainable and physicians are starting to use it and to learn how to use it. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gatz. Uh, well, we, we don't have time for more questions, but thank you for this interesting webinar. And just remind you all that this webinar has been recorded and will be available in the MP website, which is www.mpeurope.org, and will be also available in our YouTube channel. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Gatz, and uh, have a nice evening. Thank you very much all for listening.